um, AG could be specific to say on these three entities that have done well, this is where we are saying um, they could improve on one, two, three, and four. But on this specific one that has regressed, these are the specifics uh, that we need to look into. This is will this will make much life easier for us as we call the entity later to be able to look into what has been recommended by by auditor general. Coming to what Honorable Litsi has spoken to in relation to irregular expenditure, I think um, it is also a uh, critical that we get an idea on where does this irregular expenditure emanate from because irregular expenditure can can be informed by a number of issues but with specific with specific uh, with specifically on this one can, can we get an indication where does it emanate from whether it could be penalties whether it could be this and what is it that the department or this particular entity could do we are quite happy i'm quite happy with the internal controls when you look at them the last part of the presentation it's clear it's clear that these three entities or these four entities that are tightening up their internal controls but there could be some smaller challenges there and there but i like i said when i started we must give gratitude and credit to you and congratulate uh, the department as well as as the entities that have done good uh, um congratulate them and say job well done, let's maintain the momentum and let's make sure that we meet our targets. Thank you very much, Sikhan. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Honorable Masati. Also, yeah, let's just leave it there for now. Perhaps we can hand over um, to Mr. Van Furen and his colleagues to then respond to us. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members for, uh, for those questions. Um, I'll start off and then I'll hand over to Nozipo to maybe address one or two of them. I would like to start off with the with the last question of the honourable member uh, with regard to the recommendations. Um, in in this specific portfolio, it is actually a portfolio that, if you look at the outcomes, is is it's a very um, a clean uh, audit outcome. There was only one real issue which had an impact on the HSRC's audit report, and that was non-compliance with supply chain management. And that was specifically in the environment of donor funding. And, and I, I will I will talk a bit more about that that that, that later. So if you then look at it, at what needs to happen to change the audit outcome. Um, it's only one matter that needs to that that needs to be addressed, and there was there was specifically also a question to say, um, what can the entity do um, to 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 uh, to prevent this uh, for the uh, for the future? So, uh, what the entity can do to prevent it for the future is to either uh, negotiate with the um, uh, donors uh, and brought, bring to their attention that in South Africa. Um, all entities have to comply with Section 217 of the Constitution, uh, which, which requires whenever an organ of state uh, procures, it needs to do in a manner that is very equitable, transparent and cost effective. Uh, so that they either um, uh, allow the HSRC to, to, to follow its own uh, procurement process as prescribed by law, or if that is, cannot be done, then the HSRC should approach the um, National Treasury uh, and request a deviation, which uh, uh, which National Treasury can then either approve or, or, or not approve. That is why our recommendation uh, on, 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 on the slides specifically deal with it to say that the accounting authority should strengthen the preventative controls to identify non-compliance. So in the case of the HSRC, uh, there was non-compliance uh, over a number of transactions, uh, you know, and 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 um, that preventative controls did not identify that there was this non-compliance, and it continued there uh, over 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 a, 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 a period of uh, a period of time. Um, I, I, I trust that that uh, helps uh, uh, on the chairperson in terms of a bit more detail in terms of our recommendation. So it, it also talks to policies and procedures. 
that then, because this risk has been identified, the policies and procedures should be updated to, to clearly indicate to the, to, to the users of those policies and procedures that whenever you res we receive donor funding and the donor have got a specific requirement that we use a specific service provider, that we need to, to um, um, uh, approach National Treasury for a deviation or approach the, um, uh, uh, the uh, donor uh, to, um, to allow uh, the entity to follow the normal procurement processes. That's why we make the recommendation uh, to say that the, that the HSRC should ensure that policies are updated um, um, and that staff are adequately uh, receiving uh, training. Uh, and then, of course, the development of an action plan, and, and that is always something that we, that we recommend whenever there's audit findings, have an action plan to say what is it that we will now do to address these findings. So that action plan should typically now uh, uh, talk to the changes in the, the policy, the training, and also approaching National Treasury for condonement for the, the irregular expenditure that has been incurred. If the ICSRC does that, then it should be able to be in a position again to um, to have a, a, a clean a, a clean audit outcomes. Um, I, I trust that that's a bit more detail also on, on, on what caused the, the irregular expenditure. Um, uh, it was basically uh, appointing specific service providers instead of complying with Section 217 of the Constitution to give everyone a fair, equitable, uh, um, uh, and transparent um, uh, process. Um, Jefferson, you asked a question about the, the MI implementation. Um, yes, so so uh, the 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 uh, amendments to the Public Audit Act that that um, has brought about the material irregularity uh, sections uh, um, will then become effective uh, to the entities in 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 the DSI portfolio for the 21-22 financial year. It will basically mean that we will apply. Uh, that section of the of the um, public audit act, and it's included in that slide, uh, the, the slide that that gives us the definition of a material irregularity, and that will mean that throughout the audit processes, we will evaluate transactions that uh, it may attract a risk of a potential uh, material irregularity. We will evaluate against the definition of a material irregularity. And if there is indeed uh, any of those uh, transactions identified, the normal process would then apply in terms of material irregularity notification uh, to the accounting authority uh, and in giving the accounting authority the opportunity to respond. And, and, and the, 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 the process is, 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 is meant uh, for the accounting authority or accounting officer to stop the, the material irregularity from happening and limiting any losses and recover any losses and ensure that consequence management um, takes place. Um, and then ultimately, uh, if you follow through that process, you know, if, if that does not happen, it, it then can either be um, uh, uh, referred to a other, another body for investigation or the AG can make recommendations. And if that is not followed, uh, it can then ultimately lead to a certificate of debt or if it is handed over to another entity for investigation, that entity's uh, mandate will then be applicable. Let's say it's something that's being being referred to the SIU, then, then the SIU will take the matter further and only report progress to the um, to the Auditor General. Um, there was a question about how do we audit um, performance information and 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 why do we not express an opinion on on performance information so our three key focus areas in an audit is uh, rightly as indicated um the audit of the financial statements on which we express an opinion and then the audit of performance information which we currently in the audit report report factual findings or we indicate that there's no material findings and then audit of compliance with laws and regulations on which we also do not express an opinion but if there's any material non-compliance then we report that also as specific non-compliance findings uh, in the audit report so uh, currently what we do is, is we, we we do express a opinion uh, on performance information in the management report so that the entity can get an idea what it would have looked like if we would have expressed the, the opinion in the audit report and and for for all the entities uh, that in in this portfolio uh, that we've that all the general have audited 
uh, those opinions in the management report was was unqualified to, um, opinions. So in the case of, of the DSI, there was a material adjustment made, but ultimately the information reported um, was um, um, was fairly stated. Uh, what is important to note is is that when we audit performance information, we apply certain um, criteria. And when it comes to the specific targets and achievement of the targets, our audit focus will be whether that target is, is accurately reported. So currently what we do is, is we focus on key programs. We do not audit all the programs. We also just audit key programs for, for each and entity. Let's say, for instance, we audit a target that, that, that deals with number of bursaries um, awarded. Uh, and that target, uh, the, uh, the achievement is reported as 11,000 in the um, performance report of the entity. We will then audit um, and, and to determine whether we agree or disagree with that number. We will uh, collate the information to support it. If we then find the difference, we will communicate it to the entity. If the entity is in a position to correct it, they will correct it. Um, otherwise, we will then if it's a material indicator, express a qualified uh, 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 opinion in the management report, but we will report that specific finding uh, factually in the uh, in the audit report. We do not um, express a view on, on, on the specific achievement of targets. So if a target is only 80% achieved, um, as long as it's factually correct in the in, in the performance report, the Auditor General do not currently express a view on the fact that only 80% um, has been achieved. What we do is in the audit report, we refer the, the user in the audit report to the uh, performance report uh, in the annual report. And we, we, we basically indicate that um, for, the, for the achievement uh, of, the, of, the, of the performance, uh, refer to the following pages. Then the user can then actually read there in the um, annual report on the performance and the entities are also uh, um, have to uh, report on over and under achievement so that will give the user the full picture for the for the over or under uh, achievement um, i trust that that clarifies the, the the current approach on 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 on, on our audit of, of 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 performance information um there was a there was a question um, about the fruitless and wasteful expenditure um, of, of 27,000. Um, I will let um, Nozipa just quickly speak on it again to, to give you the main categories. But what is important is, Chairperson, is that the, the financial statements uh, will have a disclosure note which will be provide more detail on it. And if, there's, uh, if the, if the uh, committee would require more detail, uh, then the committee can request um, the uh, the entities to provide the detail. The, the same goes for the, the irregular expenditure. Uh, but um, as Nozipo has indicated during the presentation, uh, if you look at the irregular expenditure, uh, mainly uh, two, 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 two main categories. In the case of the NRF, there was just one contract uh, which was uh, extended uh, without the necessary approval. Uh, so it's an isolated case and in the case of the hsrc it relates to the uh, procurement that was done with donor funding uh, where the, uh, the correct uh, processes were not fo followed and deviations um, were not um, uh, obtained from um, from national treasury um just to explain again in, in there's a slide that um uh, we've uh, given the diagram of the entities uh, in the portfolio and there was a question about the entities which the auditor general does not just does not audit so those audit the, those entities are what we call the section 43 entities the, the, the section 43 is a a section in the public audit act which basically determines that that those entities which the auditor general um, is allowed to audit in terms of um, its legal mandate but elect not to audit it. In, in those cases, um, those entities can appoint their own auditors. They have to consult with the Auditor General on the appointment of the auditors. And we do exercise oversight over that uh, audit uh, process. However, the audit opinion is signed off by a private audit firm. So uh, in the case of, of um, this portfolio, uh, those three entities is SANSA, 
uh, TIA and, 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 and ASA. So we've given the, the high level outcomes of, of, those, um, of those entities, uh, but the Auditor General is not the, the, uh, the appointed uh, auditor for, um, at this point in time, uh, we have um, agreed that those audits being conducted by, by auditors in, in private sector. Uh, Jefferson, I will just hand over to Nozipo to, um, to just talk about the, the irregular expenditure of the fruitless and wasteful expenditure of 27,000. But like I indicated, the detail of that is also in the financial statements. And if there's any questions that we, um, we have missed, uh, uh, Jefferson, um, uh, uh, please remind us and then we will address it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lawrence. Uh, you have well covered um, all of the points. In terms of the fruitless and wasteful expenditure of 27,000, um, honorable committee members and chair, if you look into slide 17, um, it has the details that um, the um, that irregular expenditure is coming from HSRC and it's with regards to uh, missed flight and, and, uh, and traffic fines. What I also like to uh, emphasize is that um, the, as a tier end, 50% uh, of this was recovered uh, from the guilty um, uh, parties and the remainder was um, in process of being, of being recovered. Um, and then also, if you look into the same slide, slide 17, it also details the irregular expenditure and who are the highest contributors, um, and also CSIR with uh, 372,000 there. So it has uh, that graph which um, uh, highlights uh, highlight that. I think uh, we have covered any points. If there's any point that we have missed, uh, we can uh, gladly um, look into that. Jefferson, thank you. I'll hand over back to yourself. Thanks. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, and Mr. Van Furen, are there any um, other remarks from yourself? Or are you fine with the closing remarks from Nosis Nozipo? And thank you. Um, I just realized there was one point which which, which one of uh, members asked about uh, an, an entity having, uh, let's say, uh, a, a billion rands or a hundred million rands of irregular expenditure and still obtaining a clean audit. Um, I think chances of that um, happening is, 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 is very, very slim because remember we focus on the non-compliance like in the case case of the HSRC so if there's if there's an if, if there's a number of non-compliances you know, or non-compliance instances on, on on supply chain management that leads to irregular expenditure they will that will be reported in the audit report it, it, it we don't express an opinion on compliance but it will be reported in the audit report and that will mean that the entity will not receive a clean audit. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Um, I think that's all from my side. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to present to the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Van Furen, Sisno uh, Zipo, um, for your time and the work of the AG's office. Um, you've, you've clarified definitely with regards to um, Honorable Itzia's question, first question. And I think for us, what becomes very important in terms of and, and I think there's a general agreement between the AG's office and ourselves, what becomes important in terms of um, reviewing the, the, the performance outcomes of the department is that beyond the financials, I think we're all in agreement that we want to see um, the actual objectives and the mandates of, of these departments, um, or in this particular case, the Department of Science and Innovation and, and its entities. Um, and, 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 and I mean, when we think of the some of the sentiments that are in society about DSI, how, um, but what is the impact of the DSI's work? Um, what exactly does the DSI do for our communities, our societies, in terms of you know really impacting the lived realities of citizens? I think us being able to monitor, um, you know, what exactly the targets of the department are and whether or not they are meeting those targets and are performing in that particular case is then essential in terms of the work that we want to do to ensure that the DSI's mandate 
in terms of it's changing the lived realities of citizens is met. Um, but also going beyond that and, 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 you know, around the arguments around the makeup of the DSI and how, suppose, well, to a great extent, you know, in terms of transformation, we aren't where we want to be um, in the DSI. And this is where, you know, our targets to ensure transformation, to ensure that people who uh, uh, can spearhead and drive the sort of impact we want to see DSI having on the lived realities of citizens are also part and parcel um, of of that particular of this particular network. So I think you know our honourable Itzia's question becomes really essential um, in terms of, of of us wanting to ensure that that is happening. But um, your response does does assist, and of course, as we go into DSI's presentation, um, you know, and in terms of the performance of DSI. Uh, I think this is what we've been saying since the start of COVID that um, COVID has really lifted um, how essential and how pivotal a role um, DSI plays in society um, as it really literally has been at the center of trying to um, save lives. Um, so, so, so this has been a moment, COVID has been a moment where we've, we've come to understand, um, you know, the, 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 the great impact that COVID plays in, in our society. Uh, the direct impact this is uh, that sorry not COVID the direct impact uh, and role that DSI science and innovation uh, plays in our communities. Um, I'd like to then move on to <clears throat> um, uh, Mr. Van Furen, yourself and your team are more than welcome to remain um, in the meeting, um, and and you're more than welcome to leave at any point if need be. Um, but uh, as in Kloshi, you can stay throughout the rest of the meeting. Um, <clears throat> I see DG Mdracha has joined the platform, so I would like to hand over to yourself, DG. I, I still don't see um, the Deputy Minister, but we have received an apology from the Minister, so I will assume that DG, you are then uh, leading the delegation um, this morning, so I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Honorable Chair, and uh, to the Honorable uh, members that uh, uh, are with us this morning. We always enjoy engaging with yourselves, and uh, I hope today it will be like that, and we hope everyone is healthy. Um, the presentation was sent, and I'm wondering if um, uh, the secretary would be able to load it. If not, I'm happy to load it from my side. Shanas, are you able to load it from your side? And then we'll just move the slides and speak to them. And with your permission, Chair, I'll probably switch off my video so that uh, we can have more bandwidth and more voice. That's fine. Can you try? Okay, thank you. Okay, I think it's going to be difficult from my side because the recording from my screen, the recording, the recording runs from my screen, so I can't minimize to do things or let me just see. Perhaps the easiest could be to make DG or one of DG's colleagues a co-host so that they can then um, run, run it for you. Because it is a bit tricky to host and, <laughs> and to fly to things. And they use our screen when we host for the broadcasting, so then we can't limit or reduce the screen. Okay, so DG, who's, uh, who could um, flight the presentation for you? Can you do it, or would you like to delegate that to someone in your team so we can make them co-host? Uh, I'm trying to load it. Uh, share oh, there we go. No, we can't see you, DG. There we go. Okay, thank you very much. So I'll thank put you. it on the full mode and hopefully... You can see it on the full slide mode. Um, where's Honorable Itzia to assist us with this process? Um, it was better before it went into full mode, but Honorable Itzia knows how to get it from out of this view that we have. I am here. Yeah. Uh, uh, good morning, DG. Uh, please go to display settings there in the top bar. Display settings. In the top bar. Yes. And then, uh, uh, yeah, the first one. Swap presenter view. Yes. 
Yes. That's okay. All. Yeah, well, I'm an IP specialist, Honorable Lizzie. <laughs> right. DJ knows that I will, I will send an invoice, no problem. No, no, definitely, because that's innovation. <laughs> we'll do the best to pay as quick within 30 days, uh, Honorable Lizzie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, what we hope to share with the committee today is the uh, uh, reflection on the uh, goals of the work that we do as a department. We will then identify some uh, key achievements per each of the outcome goals. And then we will we have selected some highlights on the performance. Uh, sometimes we've gone into the detail. Uh, um, for the presentation today, we'll probably not talk to some of the detail, for an example, on the work that the National Policy Data Observatory was doing to support COVID. Uh, we've provided perhaps uh, too much detail. We'll give the overall uh, performance as well as um, the financial performance, which I'll hand over uh, to the acting CFO. So just to recap, Chair, Honorable Members, uh, these are the um, goals of the work that we do uh, to have a transformed, inclusive, responsive, coordinated, and efficient national system of innovation. As we've shared with the um, committee before, uh, this is the engine as well as the suspension of uh, the work that we do. Uh, we of course need human capabilities on this engine and skills for the economy and for development and we will share with you uh, just the snippet of the outcomes but the NRF is joining us later and they will drill deeper into these human capabilities. And then increase knowledge generation. We need knowledge uh, in order to uh, look at uh, what knowledge can do further down the line and innovation outputs. Uh, and then uh, some examples of uh, the uh, knowledge that has been utilized to support economic development, uh, utilization of knowledge for inclusive development, and examples of the work that we are doing uh, to support a capable and a developmental state. So we had... Um, <clears throat> 45 targets that were achieved in blues, which translate to 87, uh, and then seven targets, which constitute 13% that were not achieved. Uh, and we will uh, give reasons uh, for the ones that were not achieved later on uh, in the presentation. So if we then speak to uh, what we are doing and where we are on the first uh, objective, the transformed, inclusive, responsive, coordinated, and efficient NSI. Uh, during this year that we are reporting, as uh, the committee members would know that the decadal plan was approved by cabinet in March. Uh, and then we were then asked to go into a detailed consultation with government departments. So endorse interdepartmental consultations on this uh, plan to discuss the cross-cutting NSI. On the 25th of November this year, the interministerial committee that was uh, set up during this process will be meeting, where we'll be giving feedback on the consultations that we had. Uh, one of those recommendations was to have a budget coordination mechanism that will pool resources from different government departments uh, horizontally, that is national departments and vertically, uh, that is provincial and local government in order to have a budget for the science, technology, and innovation work that we do uh, as a department, but that could have an impact uh, on other government departments, provincial, as well as local government. So we are very happy that an agreement has been reached with National Treasury, that a public STI budget coordination mechanism be integrated into the annual medium-term expenditure committee process to improve the allocation of funding. It's, we think this is a very big and a major breakthrough. We hope at the uh, meeting that we will be having on the 25th, this will be endorsed, and then we'll start to see how other government departments are putting budgets and how those budgets are allocated. In order to address the point that you made, Chair, how do we get bigger impact on the work that we are doing as a Department of Science and Innovation? The committee would also know that the re review report on the higher education science, technology, and inno innovation institutional landscape was finalized, presented to the minister, sorry, in September 2021. And this document uh, is ready for 
uh, release uh, for further public comments uh, and the minister is uh, ready to do so. On the human capital development targets, as I said, I will just mention this a little bit. Uh, the NRF will go through the details of this. This just is a breakdown of the uh, total beneficiaries of postgraduate bursaries, as well as the internship program that we run. Uh, on the internship program, you can see that uh, we had uh, just over a thousand interns that were placed in science, technology and innovation institutions and uh, a total of 11,571 uh, students receive postgraduate funding. And you can see the breakdown of uh, black students, 9,000, women, 6,999, uh, 5,600 uh, black women and people with disability, 47, and the bulk of them are South Africans, as you can see uh, at, at, the, at the end. Uh, at, on the current transformation interventions, a task team has been established within the DSI that will be looking at uh, co-creating a robust and evidence-based transformation agenda for the next 10 years. We did indicate to the portfolio committee that this uh, transformation framework is under development and uh, in consultation with the entities. So hopefully at the next engagement with yourself, we will be able to give you a sense of how uh, we intend to uh, address uh, the second comment that you made in your opening remarks, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, 50 artisans and technicians were trained in the energy and the agricultural sectors. So what we have been doing since we are under one ministry is we've been piloting how we can have uh, artisanal and technical training aligned to some of the programs that we've been uh, run, uh, running as a department. So with the hydrogen fuel cell work, uh, there was a training that was conducted through uh, this private sector company, Bambili Energy Group, in partnership with the University of Pretoria. In support of uh, the, uh, the implementation of the cabinet approved hydrogen strategy uh, through the 15 year HISA program, 17 graduates, um, uh, 15 unemployed TVET graduates with mi minimum N4 chemical and electrical engineering then underwent this six week program. And the idea is that as we deploy these hydrogen fuel cells, the uh, uh, trained uh, graduates would be the ones that would maintain, would be the ones that are responsible for the deployment. Uh, and then we'll continue to look at how this can be done and also in the agricultural sector. There were 8,150 research articles that were published. Uh, and then 3,000 research grants through the uh, DSINRF managed programs. The breakdown is 49% black and 46 uh, black women. And then there were 30 research infrastructure grants that are they awarded again in partnership with the NRF and the South African Research Infrastructure Roadmap. On the work where we're trying to look at uh, the innovation outputs, the National Intellectual Property Management Office made uh, investments towards the identification of the potential intellectual property and the protection thereof. So these are some of the initiatives that they've been doing to make sure that we have the right institutional arrangement as well as uh, support to make sure that knowledge uh, does translate into products and services. So they continue to support six new offices of technology transfer from three different provinces. There are 19 uh, new and existing technology transfer job positions that uh, were then created as a result of this. Funding was provided to Safako Mahato Health Sciences University to establish an office of technology transfer to ensure that publicly financed health research outputs are identified and they find application in society. One of the expensive exercise uh, in this uh, enterprise is to make sure that uh, there is IP protection and it costs some money. So uh, we have provided the uh, refunds to, to, to the institutions to make sure that the maintenance cost of the IP protection uh, continues within the institution so you don't have high IP leakage. NIPMO IP-wise sessions on technical and vocational training. Um, colleges around the country were extended in the IP awareness campaign to continue going forward. Uh, the minister directed that uh, we start working fairly closely with the TVET system in order to 
make sure that the culture and the awareness of uh, managing intellectual property and innovation outputs that can then go into the marketplace uh, is also raised. A total of 346 trainees upskilled in IP management and technology transfer. And we are very happy to report on a national survey of intellectual property and, and tech transfer at publicly funded research institutions. So I just want to share with uh, the committee the results of this survey because there is some exciting uh, emerging data as a result of this. So an inaugural baseline survey was conducted uh, between 2008 and 2015, and it was published in 2017. And what came out of that survey is that uh, 23 higher education, or sorry, 23 higher education institutions and 10 science councils participated, giving us a response rate of 73%. We've just uh, completed the second national survey that was conducted for the period 1418, and the results were published uh, June this year. 37 publicly funded R&D institutions governed by the R I IPR Act participated, and we had a 100% response rate. We would be happy to come and share with the portfolio committee the outcomes uh, of this survey, but we just want to give you uh, some high level findings uh, out of uh, uh, this survey. On the right hand side, you will see that 92% of the institutions had a dedicated technology transfer function. So it may not be an office, but they are looking at how we can take knowledge that is being generated into the institution into the marketplace. They have 169 staff members that are employed in these uh, tech transfer functions across all the institutions and then 60% plus uh, of staff members are employed on a permanent basis. And the rest is just breaking down in terms of um, female between uh, universities or higher education institutions and science councils. So we are in the 65% plus, and then black um, in the higher education, 82% and 68 uh, in the science councils. Uh, and then uh, we also try and make sure that the staff qualifications uh, of these people uh, is uh, in line with what they are expected uh, to do. So we're very, very happy then. Um, uh, and you'll also see on the left-hand side that in the HEI, the increase was 16.7 percentage points to 81.9 percent of the individuals from the baseline survey that was done uh, in the first round. So again, we are beginning therefore to capacitate these offices and hopefully very soon we are going to see higher um, results of knowledge transfer. On the expenditure and funding, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we just want to clarify that the economic value added MVA extends far beyond just the number of licenses that are concluded in revenue that, that, that is end. And this includes impact, which has not necessarily been quantified and reported on, and what has come out of this survey is that we need to find ways of uh, quantifying benefits that are not measured just only in terms of uh, the rents and cents. And the team has started to look at how we'll be able, uh, for instance, to have evidence-based studies for social benefits and economic benefits. So in the next round of survey, we hopefully will be able to report on that. Uh, so if you look on the right hand side, you will see some expenditure that uh, the institutions are reporting on over 50 billion plus on R&D, uh, 4 billion plus on clinical trials, uh, 265 million plus expenditure on IP transaction and maintenance costs that I referred to earlier on, uh, uh, 315 million plus expenditure on technology transfer operations and 2.74 million uh, on the IP enforcement. We have approximately 215 million in seed funding that is awarded to institutions. It's a very important early indicator of whether you've got ideas that can then be converted uh, into products or IP that could be commercialized. And the, as the 2018, 78% of the institutions reported that they did not have sufficient funding for technology development, upscaling and commercialization. The amount that they indicated is uh, of the order of about 400 million, right? So this is a very important outcome 
for policy uh, that we have to then um, think about. And as we go to cabinet uh, and as we engage with treasury, we will then try to look at how we can then raise that amount. Uh, on the portfolio, uh, maybe on the right hand side, uh, sort of on the left hand side, there's a 23.7% increase in reported new actionable disclosures over the survey. The total number of actionable disclosures managed by the technology transfer functions more than doubled over the survey period. So it means that people are saying, I have found something that I would like to disclose for protection uh, in the uh, publicly financed institution. And the fact that we are doubling this uh, since the last survey indicates that we are on an upward uh, trajectory. On the right hand side, uh, you can then see the actionable disclosures reported at NIPMO 1250 plus, a uh, new IPR Act patent applications filed uh, 700 plus, and patent families 350 plus, uh, trademark uh, filed 300 plus, and IPR Act design applications 145 uh, plant, appraisers, plant appraisers rights application. So again, a slow building of the portfolio in this area of uh, IP protection. Another interesting um, uh, metric uh, was the tracking of the number of uh, uh, startup companies. So you can see on the right hand side that over the period 1418, there were 55 startup and spin out companies that were formed by the technology transfer functions. 70% of the startups and spin out companies were formed by four institutions. This is an excellent indicator because as now we know that it's on the four institutions, we can then start to say, why are the other institutions not giving us startup companies? And if there are barriers, we then engage with them on the policies uh, or, of what needs to be done. And we have some insights uh, for some of those that are not part of the generation of spin out companies. 290 plus licenses concluded, 80% of these uh, licenses are concluded by five institutions and you would suspect that those five institutions are fairly close to the four that are also generating startups. 40 uh, IP um, uh, patents were assigned to somebody uh, in order for them to produce under license. Uh, and then 235 IP transactions yielded revenue uh, to the institutions with over 50% yielding, of course, for now less than 100,000 in any given year, but institutions are beginning to get uh, money back as a result of these transactions. 185 million plus IP transaction revenue was generated, 23 million plus commercialization uh, uh, revenue paid to the creators and enablers, which means that you give money back to people as an incentive for having disclosed and, and developed something that is commercialized. 96 options were granted, of which 95% were granted by AGIs and 100 spin out companies formed since 2008. And 95% of these uh, companies um, uh, were from AGIs and 72 uh, operational. This is since 2008, so this is a, you know, a cumulative number. So if we now just give some highlights on the work that we've done on the COVID, uh, we are happy to report on the work that the Northwest University did um, where digital COVID screening and data storage tool for a special needs school in Northwest was developed by Professor Lenta Krobler and Dr. Henry Murray. Product awarded, awarded to a UNECA Innovation Award and confirmed as a national finalist for South Africa by the world Summit Awards 2020 in the COVID screening category. It was also nominated by Northwest Department of Education for the Center for Public Service Innovation Award. A team of engineers led by Professor Hrobler developed a remote monitoring system, which will enable experienced nurses and clinicians to remotely monitor a large fleet of ventilators of different makes and models on a single centralized monitoring system and international patents are in the process of being filed from this work. This is the uh, familiar work that was reported many, many, many times on the genomic surveillance tools, uh, which again arose out of early investments 
that were done by the department. So there was genom genomic surveillance, which is a critical component of how we were um, responding to the pandemic. And uh, we detected uh, new variants with multiple spike mutations that affected some vaccine response. And uh, it was through this work that uh, the early um, policy decision was made on the J and J vaccine. And then there was plasma uh, blood connect, uh, collected from people infected with the 501YV2 variant that indicated that, that there was good neutralizing activity uh, and also against the first wave virus and potentially other variants. So this was extremely useful to indicate that uh, those people infected with this variant uh, were able to have uh, immunity against the variant in other lineages. And South Africa has the scientific tools to evaluate new variants and effects on neutralizing uh, and vaccines as, as, as we have indicated. So there were media briefings. Uh, uh, again, I don't have to bore the uh, members on this. The update on the national genomic sequencing South Africa and variants in South Africa, the effect of this uh, variant 501YV2, which was found, and its effect on neutralizing itself and other variants. This was uh, in the public domain. We also at the beginning uh, uh, established this national policy data observatory. And I, I hope that when the committee engages with the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, they'll be able to get the details. So all what we want to do here is just to provide you uh, with a menu of some of the work that this uh, data observatory has been doing uh, at the CSR. This was set up to support NAD joints interministerial committee on vaccines and other departments such as the uh, de Department of uh, Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation and GCIS on the work that the science system has been doing to support COVID. So we've been able to have uh, provincial district uh, data, uh, district profiles, mobility patterns, and this has been used quite often uh, during the uh, upset of the virus during different um, waves, uh, societal sentimental analysis, national government online data portal, which um, they set up uh, using available data to research and evaluate search across different areas, uh, use community surveys and social economic matters working with the HSRC, National Institute of Humanities and Social Science, uh, the South African uh, Population uh, Research Infrastructure, Space Agency and others. And then uh, they've been doing work to support the IMC on vaccine rollout, including conducting research on various aspects and data collection. Uh, they've been doing some global trends and other data sources. I think it's the same information, um, uh, perhaps presented differently. Um, and then there are a number of other um, COVID related work, which was done by the National Policy uh, Data Observatory. They developed in partnership with Stats SA Vulnerability Index, demographics on COVID-19, um, CHPC parameter on resource allocation, completed household impact study with uh, SAPRIN and so forth and so forth. We also have been working to support uh, traditional or mature sectors of the economy. Uh, so what we just want to highlight here is that uh, how can you use a technological innovation in order to improve economic growth? And in partnership with other government departments and economic sectors, we have spearheaded uh, focus uh, efforts that exploit the use of knowledge capabilities for economic impact for a variety of areas, advanced technologies and industries, improved government service delivery, improved productivity and competitiveness and technology transfer support, to small medium enterprises and firms. Uh, and I just wanted to share with you some of the work that uh, in the mining sector is an example of how we want to introduce and continue to support uh, the long longevity of the mining sector. There is a program called the South African Mining Extraction Research Development Innovation Program, SAMEDI, which was developed and launched the mining equipment and technology available availability readiness um, uh, atlas and this work was done uh, with the mineral council of south africa and the vision is of this strategy is to maximize the sustainable returns of south africa's mineral wealth through collaborative research development and innovation 
and implementation of mining technologies in a socially, environmentally, and financially sustainable manner that is rooted in the local community and national economy. We can give you the details of this, uh, and, and, and the idea is to have the long longevity of current mines, mechanized mining systems, um, and making sure that these applications are centered around people. A couple of weeks ago, there was an agreement signed between uh, CSIR that is implementing this on our behalf, the Mineral Council, South Africa, as well as all the unions in the mining sector around what would mechanized mining means and how do we then start to think about the skills that we will need um, uh, for the people who are working in the, in the mining area. Advanced all body knowledge so that uh, we can really be able to mine uh, much more smarter. Also, we've been doing work in revitalizing agriculture. We've shared the details of this uh, program before. Today, we just perhaps want to give three or four examples of the work that again comes out of that. Uh, through this program, a patent for novel xylanase enzyme formulation with commercial application in the animal feed additive industry was developed. An anti-tech polymerase fragmented antibody technology uh, to improve diagnostic capabilities uh, in the agricultural sector was also uh, developed. Uh, and then uh, we also have innovation support in agro-processing and value chain that yielded two potential IP products in citrus research during um, the period of reporting. So these are just examples of knowledge and products that are supporting uh, using bio uh, to revitalize or agriculture or to modernize it. And then uh, we had a bilateral research program with Malawi that was supported. And the idea was to have new proactive interventions for diagnostic surveillance, monitoring, and early warning system uh, in aquaculture health and, and, and the feed program. We are also uh, happy to report the progress that we are making uh, on the indigenous knowledge work. Uh, in particular based COVID-19 research team uh, within this community has made progress in the investigation of herbal medicines uh, uh, against COVID-19. The University of the Free State has been working with uh, farmers uh, and the US FDA um, at an approved facility to look at um, extracting the in ingredient in the herbal medicine and validate some of the work that uh, the uh, farmers and indigenous knowledge holders have been um, uh, working on. And because uh, um, this work uh, has not really within SAPRA uh, been developed, what we have been doing is we have been uh, developing um, the capacity within SAPRA to make sure that uh, there is approval on some of this work on herbal medicine. So, a clinical trial protocol was developed and sent to two international regulators as part of learning and confirming uh, the active ingredients that were uh, developed with the University of the Free State. So we're very, very happy with this. Uh, and, and hopefully when uh, these active ingredients are confirmed, we will then be able to start working closely with uh, SAPRA in order to make sure that uh, some of those uh, ingredients and those uh, natural medicines um, can then be approved and start being used for, um, uh, for COVID-19 treatment. On the health innovation, again, uh, we have supported six, six platforms on African traditional medicines, uh, cosmetics and, and, and nutrition work, health infusion, and then we've also been providing incubation and commercialization, including enterprise development. So over 20 products and prototypes were further supported through these six platforms and six medical cannabis prototypes on cancer, diabetes, neurodegenerative conditions, pain and brain performance were developed. And two cosmeceutical projects with two enterprise development arms were supported in Pumalanga, Gauteng and the Eastern Cape. So the mainstreaming of the IKS work has received a major boost with the approval of the establishment of the IKS platform on African medis medicines at the University of the Free State under uh, Professor Matsabisa. And we are very, very happy with this work and uh, what TIA has done uh, to support this. We also have work where we develop decision support tools and information management systems 
to provide policy and decision makers with relevance space-based derived spatial information and tools to support evidence-based decision making. The DSI together with the space agency provided uh, services to the National uh, Disaster Management Center, Department of Small Development and National Department of Human Settlements. This was uh, around uh, the development of spaza shops during uh, uh, COVID and the department wanted to know what was happening, a uh, small business, uh, which spaza shops were there before and which ones uh, were new and which ones were real. And then uh, the Department of Human Settlements on the expansion um, of uh, uh, human settlements in areas that they, they shouldn't be. Uh, also, we have supported the Department of uh, Forestry and Fisheries on the National Oceans and Coastal uh, Information Management System, as uh, the committee would know. We have satellites that were built at CPUT that are providing information on all the ships on our coast, and then we are able to pick up uh, ships that shouldn't be there uh, through this system. On the district development model, we are extremely happy that we are making progress as a department in the system uh, to strengthen capacity also at local municipal level, contributing to local economic development. A data observatory, which uh, has been being developed, engaging lead departments for an observatory to enable real access to uh, district development model information. Uh, this is what we will be offering to this uh, work and uh, hopefully uh, also harness solutions developed from the national system of innovation for the district development model. That, that work is currently happening with our entities and then um, uh, district development information, uh, development model project information was submitted uh, to COCTA for planning purposes. So we've analyzed the DDM profiles uh, across some district. We have developed a, a district development model project selection criteria, which projects uh, need, to, which are responsive to the profiles. If there's a particular challenge in the profile, uh, what in relation to the NSII initiatives that can assist early emerging ideas towards uh, the draft um, DSI district development model plan. We have identified 129 initiatives that meet the criteria and are responsive to the profiles. As I've indicated, if in a particular area, there is a challenge, for instance, on water related um, uh, sanitation, and then we speak to the Water Research Commission and we say, this is what we can provide. Establish uh, the DSI's entities, a committee coordinated by the Academy and several meetings have been had in order to draw then on the uh, activities that we can put together to support this. Submitted uh, the list of projects uh, from the DSI and entities to the Department of Cooperative Governance and the DSI um, uh, and the CSR is working to develop an impact simulator uh, um, tool. This is just an example to show that what we have done, uh, for instance, um, within the Gauteng region, we've looked at all the initiatives that we are supporting, uh, and then we do this in all of the provinces, and this is how we provide, therefore, our response to, um, to COCTA. We also have participated in a diverse port portfolio of international partnership initiatives and uh, took part in a global research program with partners such as EU, Japan, and the BRICS uh, consortium. We've promoted South Africa as a preferred partner for excellence in science cooperation, nominated uh, to serve on the UNESCO Open Science Advisory Committee and the adoption next week at the meeting of this uh, uh, open science uh, policy. Uh, we have had most engagements that took place in programs linked to strategic priorities areas with the strong support of the policy intents of the white paper. We've also benefited from four to six international human capital development opportunities where we have um, our postgraduate students having exposure to partner countries, institutions, and eight projects are supported uh, in relation to the implementation of uh, SDGs as part of collaboration. The minister will very happy launch the OR Tambo Africa Research Chairs initiatives, Initiative, which aims to contribute to the improvement of the African global research competitiveness 
while responding to the continent's socioeconomic needs. 18 projects related to the AU Agenda 2063 were uh, supported Africa Open Science Consultation Forum, Advancing Entrepreneurial Universities in Africa, Strengthening Africa's Medicines Manufacturing Capacity. And there were 17 initiatives that were supported in response to the Southern African Development Com Community Regional Indicative Strategic Development Plan. plan. Uh, just to give you a snippet of the entity's um, overview, uh, the uh, audit outcomes have already been shared um, with the committee. Um, we did analyze the report. Uh, we are aware that some entities' performance were uh, affected by COVID-19 pandemic, as it would be expected. And then the lockdown and restrictions to traveling and hosting of events led to saving in funds on some of the areas. And the DSI entities, as we have shown, have played a key role in terms of contributing to COVID-19. We are aware that uh, we have to work harder to address some of the transformation issues, uh, which are still a challenge. Um, but we do feel that uh, progress has been made uh, with the annual reports targets, and most of them were approved for tabling uh, in parliament by the minister on the 30th. Uh, again, I will not go through this because uh, the um, uh, AG spent, I think, time just giving you a sense of the audit status and how many of the uh, targets were achieved by the entities and the portfolio committee would get uh, details of this as the entities present. So which targets were not uh, uh, done? So we'll just go through the reasons. It's usually process delays. This refers to under non-achievement due to factors which are not within our control. However, such targets require that uh, as a department, we do better um, in managing the interdependent nature of the deliverables uh, which affect us. So we're working with um, the entities so that when the internal audit or the auditor general seeks evidence, there are no delays sometimes with the documentation. And then the second one is uh, uh, non-ineffectiveness of implementers. This is uh, non-achievement due to deficiencies during implementation phase. Uh, as a department, we think that uh, we need to do better in the planning of these targets to be aligned with the entity's targets. And we are engaging the entities in this. And then sometimes um, on an ongoing basis, we have to improve on the uh, formulation of uh, targets. So let me then quickly go through some of these. Uh, we were supposed to have uh, delivered a flight model for the satellite development program, and this has been delayed due to the effects of uh, COVID-19 on global space value chain. Uh, we were supposed to have 71 black, uh, 200 black emerging farmers uh, uh, benefiting from technology innovation support. We could only report on 71, and the reason was that uh, some of the uh, information um, in signed report could not be verified. So again, uh, it's just to make sure that when we agree that this would be the support with the implementers, we work early with them that this information must be made available at the time of reporting. 32 capacity building initiatives were targeted. Uh, we only achieved 17. And again, this is uh, as a result of rest restrictions in COVID engagement opportunities with historically disadvantaged institutions, which were limited as a result of connectivity in some of the rural areas. So we're working on how to improve this. And then on the regulations of the IK Act approved by the minister, minister could not approve this due to internal delays in finalizing the regulations of the act. And therefore the output was not achieved, but we are working uh, with uh, the partners that are supposed to help us to finalize this. On the uh, strategic and technical engagements with the entities, uh, we couldn't get all of the 12, we could only get nine. This is a very important indicator of uh, building uh, relationships and maintaining um, um, uh, delivery with the institutions. Uh, so we couldn't get all the meetings on time. On the um, uh, decisions that must be provided within uh, 90 days for the R&D tax incentives, uh, we have two challenges, the capacity within the R&D tax, tax incentive unit, 
we were supposed to also get our online system running. And then of course, uh, sometimes when the applications are sent, uh, we need additional information and that causes some delay. So we still working on trying to uh, optimize this process. On the Presidential Youth Employment uh, Initiative, we had uh, targeted 1,700 of beneficiaries. We could only uh, get 641. Uh, the initiative was initially encountered with delays uh, to the funding allocation. And this was done in September. So the available funding when we got the answer uh, was therefore not sufficient to continue with the initiatives. And we had to generate uh, savings, use savings from the shortfall uh, to fund this. So we'll rework this indicator now that we know exactly the funding that has been made available. So I'm going to stop here, Chair, and then hand over to the acting CFO to take us uh, through the financial performance. I would be happy, uh, um, um, Robert, to fly the slide for you. Thanks, DG. I will really appreciate that. And morning, DG, and morning, members of the committee, morning, and honorable chair, morning, members of the DSI team, and members from the ministry. I'm going to share with you the financial performance of the department for the financial year ended 2021. For <clears throat> the financial year, uh, the department was appropriated. Uh, 7.2 billion. This, um, this amount, members, we would recall, it was revised. We used to, we used to have over have over 8 billion. That was revised due to challenges experienced by COVID. Uh, we also received donor funding amounting to close to 7, 7, uh, 70 million. And also we generated uh, departmental receipts of 2, of two, two million. Uh, the spending we spent. 7.1 billion, and then 69 of that was for was, was spent under, under under donor funds. We have an environment of 113 million, which is 1.6 underwooded funds, and donor funds of 420,000, which is 0.6%. Next slide, please, TG. As I've indicated, uh, that our budget was revised. After the, the revision of our budget, we had 361 million, 361 a million in compensation, 119 million in goods and services, 6.7 billion in transfers and subsidies, 6.9 million in capital assets, and we only had about 500,000 for financial assets. Next slide, please, DG. As I've indicated, uh, the performance of already, uh, I mean, shared with you, the, uh, our in intention was to spend the whole amount, obviously but we only spend, as I've indicated, 7.1, which is 98.4%. And then this translates to, I mean, to a variance of 1.6%. There it is it, it depicted there in our, in our bar graphs. And next slide, please, DG. Spending pay programs. Uh, program one administration was appropriated 294 million. It only managed to spend 262 million. We, we, we had the variance of the 2 million, which is 10.9%. Technology innovation, which is program two, was appropriated 1.3 billion. We, we 1.397 billion, we managed to spend 1.379, so, sorry, 1.3997, and we spent 1.379 billion, which is 17 million variance of 1.2%. Under ICR, program three, we were appropriated 119 million. We spent 100, 114 million, which is 5 million variance, which is 4.3%. Research and development support, which is program four, it was appropriated 3.7 billion, 3.7 billion, 35 million. We only managed to spend 3.7 billion, uh, 3 million, which is 4, 4 million variance or 0.1%. And the socioeconomic and innovation partnerships, we were appropriated to 1 billion 781 million. We only managed to spend 1 billion 677 million, which is 53 million variance, which is 3.1%. Next slide, please, TG. Uh, we have also, also depicted there in, in bar graphs for, for ease of, of rating for, for members of the committee. 
नेक्स्ट स्लाइड प्लीज दीजिए अंडर इकोनॉमिक क्लासिफिकेशन आवर कॉम्पेंसेशन ऑफ एम्प्लॉज वॉज अप्रोप्रेट थ्री हंड्रेड एंड सिक्सटी वन मिलियन नाइन हंड्रेड एंड थ्री थाउजेंड वी ओनली मैनेज टू स्पेंड थ्री हंड्रेड एंड ट्वेंटी वन मिलियन नाइन हंड्रेड एंड थर्टी एट थाउजेंड विच इज फोर्टी मिलियन अंडर स्पेंड विच इज इलेवन पॉइंट वन परसेंट अंडर गुड्स एंड सर्विसेज वी हैड हंड्रेड एंड नाइनटीन मिलियन थ्री हंड्रेड एंड सिक्सटी वन थाउजेंड वी ओनली मैनेज टू स्पेंड हंड्रेड एंड सेवन मिलियन सिक्सटीन थाउजेंड विच इज ट्वेल्व मिलियन ट्वेल्व मिलियन अंडर स्पेंड विच इज ट्रांसलेट टू टेन पॉइंट थ्री परसेंट अंडर ट्रांसफेस एंड सब्सिडीज वी अप्रोप्रेटेड सिक्स बिलियन सेवन हंड्रेड एंड एटी नाइन मिलियन वी मैनेज टू स्पेंड सेवन हंड्रेड ट्वेंटी नाइन मिलियन विच 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 हैड इलेवन हंड्रेड इलेवन मिलियन आई वारेंस विच ट्रांसलेट टू वन पॉइंट सिक्स परसेंट अंडर पेमेंट फॉर कैपिटल असेट्स वी हैड सिक्स पॉइंट नाइन मिलियन We only spend managed to spend six million, which is nine nine thirty two thousand variance, which translate to thirteen point three percent under spend. Under payment for financial assets, we had five hundred thousand. We only managed to spend five hundred and forty seven. This one was over spent by forty seven thousand, which is nine point four percent over spend. Uh, next slide, please, Tiji. We are also the the, the graphs for members for ease of reference. Next slide, please, Tiji. Uh, we have also included the reasons for variance why we did not spend as we had uh, you know anticipated in our various classes under compensation uh, most members will will recall we have been you know informing members throughout the quarters the challenges we are experiencing as a result of covid-19 uh, so our most of our challenges you know under compensation for example we were not able to fill all the positions because there were a period where you know we couldn't fill there, there was you know Uh, quarter one, quarter two of the financial year, there was no movement at all. The lockdown affected everyone, and also we experienced cuts in 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 the various in that in that uh, line item. Uh, under goods and services, also COVID played a significant role. Most of services under this item were not rendered as planned. Uh, this quite number of them, we just included that budget vote, which were held virtually, and the public participation programs. Which were cancelled. Expenditure and credit was mainly for communication. Communication spent significant amount because we used data, used air time uh, for virtual meetings and, and and you know being able to communicate. We also paid operating leases, our machines, and also the you know uh, the property payments, you know electricity, water, and, and others. Uh, there was a cut under this item, which was as a result of COVID, and also there was another twenty million cut. You know. Uh, under this you know to other areas uh, to just to ensure that we don't have significant uh, underspending in, in these areas next slide please tichi under the transfers uh, you know delays in finalizing the in the contracts we we in, in the fourth quarter we did indicate to the committee that the reason why we did not spend uh, as we had anticipated we normally pay around 99 uh, 99.1% we did not spend that Uh, because there were payments that we couldn't spend, like uh, we, we couldn't process. Uh, presidential employment stimulus package payment was not paid because the, uh, you know, with the finalizing of that contract was very, very, you know, it, start, it started very late. As a result, when the, the period for payment came, it was very, very late for us to do that. We were not able to, to make that payment. Uh, but we we did indicate in that meeting that we we have mechanism to ensure that the the project does not suffer. We requested the environment. We From the national treasury, although it was not approved, we looked within ourselves and then we re, uh, we re reprioritized funding from other areas that was low spending. So the area did not suffer as as as, as we have indicated. The next slide, please. We also put money aside for COVID spend uh, under transfers and subsidies. Uh, we budgeted 189.7. Uh, under goods and services, we put aside 522. We spent 188. Uh, this money was put aside for you know COVID. One went to ship uh, for the for the transfer and subsidies, and then for goods and services, we we bought PE, uh, PPEs and the contamination of the building. Uh, next slide, please, Tiji. Our spending was very, very low, as I've indicated. You know, usually some of our line item will indicate significant spending. You know, when you compare it from the prior year, 
Uh, when we do an analysis for this one, only three line items spend significantly as compared to the prior year. Most of the line items were either significantly lower than we had spent in the previous years. Communications have indicated that because we have been using uh, data, I mean, airtime to communicate, it went up as compared to the other years. Computer services, we procured licenses for Microsoft Teams and, and others, Zooms for us to be able to, to communicate and have meetings. And then on the agency also services, we have been using the services of temporary, temporary employment services as a result of not being able to fill the positions that we had anticipated to fill. That line item as well went up uh, as, as, as compared to the previous year. Next slide, please, TG. <sighs> Uh, okay, due to COVID pandemic, uh, we, as I've indicated, I mean, these are the reasons, and uh, the, the reasons that we experienced loss, and there was no travel during the lockdown. Uh, you know, and then meetings only happened as a result of, I mean, happened through virtual, uh, virtual platforms. If we didn't have caterings, there was no spending for venues and facilities. There was a little maintenance on the building as a result of lockdown. There was no training that took place. And if it resumed during the course of the year, most of it was through virtual. And as I've indicated, most of the activities did not take place. As a result, we experienced low spending under goods and services. Uh, next slide, please, TG. The following items uh, I account for over 80% of our spend. Uh, I mean, if you look at our parliamentary grant, uh, the Academy of Science, uh, I can't see there because of the details. Um, Academy of Science was given 24 million, 24.8 million. Uh, and then CSIR was given 893.5 million. HSRC was given 289 million. National Research Foundation was given 859 million. The SANSA was given 161 million. Technology Innovation Agency was given 408 million. And then the line items that also spend the high human resource de uh, development, we spend 831 million under this line item. Research and development infrastructure, we spend 587 million under this line item. Square kilometer array, we spend 477 million under this line item. And South African Research Shares Initiative, we spend 544 million under this item. These items spend, uh, account for the significant uh, uh, spending on our, on our budget. And one would ask, what is the impact of underspending to the department? Uh, there won't be any financial impact, as I've indicated. Uh, the, the, the challenge with regards to underspending, not filling the positions, is that uh, officials who are covering for those who have left, they are get, uh, filling the brand you know, you know, of the workload. That is the challenge. And also on the transfer and subsidies, the presidential employment target have indicated that uh, we requested environment, but the environment was not approved. And then we looked man within the department, we prioritized with these line items. And uh, projects that were not spent under goods and services, we also looked for funds uh, within the department. We shifted funds from items that are slow spending, and then we covered this, this, this line items, including under capital assets. Next slide, please, TG. We also, uh, spent, uh, we, we aggreg uh, disaggregated spending uh, under SMMEs, SMM uh, Black women and, and, and youth. I think the area that the, the committee is quite interested in, uh, they've indicated that they wanted to see how the department is performing as far as this is concerned. So we normally, when, uh, when we were presenting the annual report, we, we normally did not include this, this slide, but I mean, the committee is quite interested in this. So we decided that we'll, from now on, it won't be only during the quarter, but we'll share this slide with the committee to, so that they can see how we are performing under this, this area. Uh, we spent, for our procurement expenditure, we spent about 47 million. And then under SMMEs, we spent 18 million. And uh, the third one million went to black companies. And then 15 million went to women-owned companies. And then the spending for the youth, it was 6.7 million. In terms of percentage, SMME account for 39.8, black owned companies 67%, spending on women companies was 31.6%, and, and spending on youth was 14.2%. And I, I must say, uh, 
when we report in the next quarter, the, the committee will see that there's a significant improvements in terms of spending in these areas. And uh, we, we have looked in these areas and uh, got the message from the committee. Uh, it is one of the areas that we, we are also you know, looking into to ensure that we, we, are, we try to give work to those who were disadvantaged in the past. Uh, we also spend uh, in COVID, we spend about eight uh, under goods and services, 1.8 8. million. Uh, and then the 1.7 of that money went to small and medium enterprises, 1.3 went to black companies, 300,000 uh, women owned, 1.1 went to youth, which is 93.4% of SMEs, 73% black owned companies, 16.3% uh, women owned companies, and 59.9% youth owned companies. Next slide, please, DJ. We also felt uh, it's better that we share with the committee how we are performing. Uh, uh, Honorable Lidzi was telling DG that he will be sending his, his invoice for having assisted the DG. Honorable Lidzi, we, we, we can tell you that your invoice won't be delayed in the department. As soon as you send it, we will pay it within 30 days. Our, our standard for paying invoice, our average is nine, is nine days. So we are trying our best to ensure that we pay all the invoices within the, in fact, way before the stipulated periods. So if, as members can see, there is no invoice that was paid beyond 15 days. We are trying by all means to ensure that as soon as we receive the invoices, they are processed so that the companies and the beneficiaries can have their monies on time. Next slide, please, DG. As a result of COVID, uh, last year, we, we normally pay our invoices uh, you know, 100%. Last year, as a result of COVID, we had challenges in uh, a few of the areas where we did not uh, pay 100%. Uh, because of the closure of the building, officials being on, uh, on quarantine, and also service provider because uh, they were not able to do other things. They were not, they didn't have, some of them did not update their tax matters on time. We only pick those when we're processing payments. So some of those, they it cost us not to pay all our invoices within the stipulated period as we would have liked to. Next, next slide, please. Next. That, that will be the end of my presentation, DG. Thank you. I will I will take uh, hand over to you and and, uh, and the chairperson of the committee. Thank you. Thanks, DG. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. DG, I don't know if you're still there. Yes, we are. Just to say thank you very much, and uh, we're handing over to you, Chair. All right. Thank you so much, TG. Um, I'd like to note hands from colleagues who would like to engage. Mm, okay. I note the hand of Honorable Sibia, Honorable Boshoff. Claire Busetti, kindly mute yourself. Well, I've muted you now, but kindly ensure that your device does not um, uh, unmute itself. All right, I've noted the hand of Honorable Mashadzi. Okay, colleagues, we will allow colleagues now to engage. Honorable Sibia, you may go ahead. Thanks, Chairperson. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, from the DG, the DG has said there are 129 identified initiatives that meet the criteria, but I would like to know from which provinces those are 129 identified initiatives. And uh, from the CFO, do we have companies owned by people with disabilities? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable Sibia. Uh, Honorable Boshoff. Thank you, Honorable Chen. And I also want to thank the department for the uh, presentation. I want to ask the DG on that uh, part uh, in which the demographics of students funded were set out. Um, the category which says Blacks, does that mean South African people um, who are black or would that include uh, people from other African countries or even America or wherever uh, black people could come from? Uh, or would black mean South African black? Uh, that's my only question at this place. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, uh, Honorable Boshoff. Honorable Masati. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, Chair, I've got just three issues to speak to. Um, one is on the performance overview, especially on the unachieved target. I see on the slide where the department indicates the variables. Um, they speak about the process delays. The reason for non-achievement is precisely because of process delays. How do they intend to, to mitigate this particular challenge? And because it is important to have clear timeframes in order to adhere to achievement of targets. Though one is cognizant of the fact that COVID might have been the main contributor. And the fact that some of these targets, if not most of the targets that were not achieved was precisely because they relied on stakeholder involvement. Given that fact, how to, because if, if we don't deal with this issue, this is a clear indication that in future, the department will consistently have this challenge of not achieving those particular uh, targets. Now, given the fact that this might be a problem, does the department see a possibility of reducing these targets based on the baselines as per this annual report, which is uh, under review? And if not, do they intend to roll over or have they done so? Because um, this is uh, 2020, 2019, I mean, 2020, 2020, um, 2021 um, annual report, do they, intent, have they rolled over those targets to the current financial year? And what will be the financial implications of such? And also, Slalom, given the non-achievement of these targets, uh, ordinarily they will also impact on the budget of the department. But I do not, see a, a correlation between the budget itself and the targets achieved or not achieved. If they could just indicate, because in my view, if you have spent 100% of your total budget, you should be able to say we have achieved 100%. But that is not always the case. But it is not clear on the presentation itself if that is the case. On compensation of employees, there is a clear indication from the presentation that critical costs were not filled for obvious reasons of COVID and budget adjustment and um, budget cuts. I just want to find out Though I've noted that those posts will be filled in the 2021 MTEF, MTEF period, but what has been the impact of none um, filling of those posts? And have they had a negative impact on the non-achievement of, of the targets? Now, when you look at the CFO's presentation, and there's a slow on the slow spending on goods and services. And part of the non spending was on training, maintenance, building, uh, uh, maintenance of buildings, and so forth. But with specific reference to the training, will that not also impact on your service delivery deliverables, given that during that period? where we had COVID and there were limitations in, in terms of movement and so on and so on, uh, employees might not have benefited from the training. And equally, 
if that is the case, how the, how does the department intend to mitigate this particular issue? And overall, Slan, just to get an indication from the department, having learned lessons from COVID, having noted the challenges that were brought to our show by COVID and the impact thereof on achievement of targets in the department. How do you intend to move forward? Because unfortunately, we're still in, in COVID up until now. How do they intend to, to deliver on all unachieved targets given the COVID issue, but moving forward, how do they intend to mitigate that? Uh, lastly, Slalo, we must commend the department for its ability to adhere to the 30 days payment. It's quite, it's, it's, it's quite impressive that they are able to achieve uh, this particular target or I would call it a target uh, of being able to pay um, service providers with, with within even with the average dates of 15 days is quite commendable and I want to believe other departments can really uh, learn from from DSI. But my 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 main main issue is on the relationship because most of the targets that you see on the presentation or of the department, they rely heavily on the external stakeholders. How do they intend to hold, um, do they have MOAs or MOUs with the department because they are inability to achieve these targets based on the external stakeholders will continuously impact the performance of the department. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Mashati. Honorable Litier. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, again, um, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, DG, um, I'm not sure if you were already logged in when we greeted your team. Uh, good morning if you're not in. <clears throat> I think um, um, maybe let me begin where Honorable Mashati finished by congratulating the, the department for uh, continuing to be an example of what uh, our government should be paying off uh, all suppliers within 30 days. I think, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, I do not want to stress the importance of doing so. SMMEs uh, generally struggle, uh, you know, to, uh, to keep their businesses afloat if they are not paid on time. Uh, uh, but the department pays them on time. You see, uh, all of them uh, less than 30 days, uh, some 10 days, seven days, which is good. You know, it, um, it supports SMMEs, and therefore, uh, it will be very interesting to see those SMMEs. Uh, how many employees do they have uh, out of those employees? Of course, it's not uh, for purposes of this meeting. And how many of those employees were uh, forced to be retrenched. You'll see that those companies that uh, uh, were paid on time by the departments uh, kept all their employees uh, in the business, whereas those that uh, come from SMMEs uh, and were not paid on time, uh, they were forced to retrench because the business could not be afloat. So I want to, to thank the department and I want to employ on them to continue doing so moving forward. Uh, it's not only doing your job, you are saving uh, uh, lives and livelihoods out there. <clears throat> um, so secondly, obviously, the good audit uh, uh, outcome of the department, we did not expect anything less. I think the professionalism of, of this team, uh, um, you know, best testament uh, 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 to, to, you know, the, the, the AGES report, Best testament to the professionalism of this team, and I want to, you know, congratulate you and your team. But continue doing so. Don't drop the ball. I know uh, Robert is the new uh, 
CFO there. Um, you know, after the previous one went to higher education, uh, continue doing so. Uh, the quality of your financial statements, uh, we do not want misstatements on those things. Continue doing so. Uh, don't drop the ball <clears throat> uh, moving forward. Uh, DG, uh, one of your entities uh, dropped the ball on, 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 on um, uh, very good record of uh, clean audits. Uh, please assist uh, uh, that entity. We know the problem. It was mm -hmm. uh, monies that came from donors which preferred uh, their own personal uh, suppliers to, to, to supply or to, to be given <coughs> uh, uh, those purchase orders. <coughs> uh, but uh, assist them. Uh, uh, the AG has already indicated that uh, those things could have been avoided by uh, uh, seeking concurrence from Treasury, so your team must assist. We do not want uh, a situation here where we have, um, uh, you know, a very bad audit, uh, <clears throat> a very bad audit uh, outcome. On, on finances, uh, CFO, you indicated that you could not spend most of your money, or well, all of your money, you spend most. Uh, you could not spend all of your money. <clears throat> um, uh, you are making our job extremely difficult. Uh, this portfolio committee has been clear from all political parties concerned that uh, this department is underfunded. Uh, and even with that underfunding, you're still not finishing. You know, uh, you know, you, you, if you want to assist us in making sure that, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we ask for more money from treasury to, to the department. Uh, you must finish your money. Of course, you must do it. You must do it right. You must follow all processes. But if you don't finish it, uh, it, it becomes a problem uh, in us uh, asking for more money from treasury because they will say, "But even the little that we gave you, you are, you are unable to to finish it." So, uh, if it means we must uh, advertise for posts uh, that are vacant in the department, let's do so, uh, and all of those things and. Uh, <clears throat> Lastly, have we applied uh, a treasury to keep the money that uh, was, uh, was, was, was left behind, was left in the coffers for the 2020-2021 uh, financial year, uh, so, that for, so that we retain it uh, for other purposes? And uh, if we have, have we received a, a response from treasury? Um, yeah, no, thank you very much. Uh, those were the few things that... Uh, generally just comments and one just to, that one question that would have wanted. I mean, it's very difficult, you know, Chair, to ask uh, the department questions, especially on uh, a process like this, because, uh, you know, they're always on point. They always do the right things. And this year they've even given us a breakdown of uh, uh, black uh, youth, uh, women owned companies that they've empowered with uh, businesses, which is good. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Litsie. Just a few questions from my side or maybe comments um, as well. Um, just on, on, on semantics, really, DG, um, when, we speak to the, when we speak of the Decadal Plan, I think um, this committee has to a great extent expressed its, um, uh, the fact that we are pleased uh, with the strides we have made in, 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 in working on the decadal plan. Um, however, we just like clarity on the semantics. So often we would refer to the decadal plan being in uh, being a draft decadal plan, which is in the process of being finalized. Um, and part and parcel of doing that work is, for example, the update you gave us with regards to the, the consultations you're having across departments. Um, in relation to uh, budget coordination and just various commitments that we want to see from different departments. So in terms of the language we use in saying it's a draft document or a draft decadal plan, which is in the process of finalization and the target that then we say we have met in terms of finalizing the decadal plan. Um, are there no particular, from your, your point of view, are there no particular contradictions with regards to saying we've met that target of finalization and saying, um, we are in the process of finalizing it and therefore it's a draft. It's really semantics, DG. Um, however, I just like your, your perspective on, on that particular. Uh
with regards to the documentation centers and the delays um, caused by uh, the finalization of the regulations that you did um, articulate and give, uh, give reasoning to DG, we just want to, of course, um, stress our concern with regards to that, noting the importance of these documentation centers in promoting and protecting indigenous knowledge systems in our country and relating to some of the work that you also shared with us um, in terms of uh, work that is being done um, in promoting uh, indigenous um, knowledge systems through traditional medicines. Um, and then in relation to, uh, you know, the, the performance targets that were not achieved, DG is given reasoning um, to, to why many of them have not been achieved. Um, however, we must stress, for example, with regards to the 200 Black emerging farmers, um, that particular target not being, well, not being met in terms of also the 71 Black emerging farmers being the actual target as opposed to the 200 which, had, which, which, which we had targeted. And the, one of the reasons being that um, we, we did not have those particular supporting documents. And I think in a department like this, DG, where we really do, it's just not something that we would expect um, to come out of the Department of Science and Innovation for us not to have documentation to support work that is being done. And so we, we really want to stress, oh, and, and really want to stress the importance of us ensuring that documentation is there to support the amazing work, um, um, to support the evidence of the amazing work that is being done by the department and that it is done timelessly. I think from your department, PG, we only expect uh, the best. Um, and then with, in relation to research and develop, uh, research development and support, um, we had targeted that uh, 2.4 uh, thousand uh, PhD students be awarded bursaries annually and only 303 PhD students were awarded and DG gave reasoning as to you know what 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 took place there but I mean in light of our demand for in light of the demand for postgraduate funding this is for us as a committee very concerning um, uh, uh, and you know when we even take it further DG to speak to speak to the fact that we want to see an increase of A-rated researchers, um, an increased representation on who are our A-rated researchers. Um, you know, funding for postgraduate studies like at a PhD level becomes essential in that type of ripple effect that we want to see in that particular transformation, you know, as we want, as, 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 as yeah. So, so, so for us, us making sure that, um, we meet our targets with regards to funding for postgraduate studies is essential in the long-term uh, goals that we have in terms of transforming the science and innovation space. In relation to socioeconomic um, um, partnerships, they, this concern DG in terms of um, us or the challenge in terms of us not being able to meet this particular target with regards to um, the lack of capacity on the online system and, you know, those, those particular IT challenges is a reoccurring particular challenge. And yes, there have been strides that have been made, but we're not meeting that target um, uh, as quickly as we'd want to meet it. And so that becomes a concern. And maybe the question we should be asking is what is being done? And then, yeah, I think that's probably my last comment or, or question to yourselves. And then maybe, you know, just from a perspective of, of presentation, um, and it really is maybe, you know, one may view it as semantics. It, we, we could perhaps consider reviewing the, the presentation format um, of, of, of the department when it comes to the annual, um, the annual report in terms of being able to clearly outline the direct targets versus the system targets um, or in order for us to be able to see the work being done by the department and of course through its entities, um, but, you know, um, it's something that the department can consider. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's semantics, but it can assist us in better being able to analyze the type of uh, progress we're making in terms of the performance of the department and its entities. But it's something you can really just consider, DG. And lastly, you know, when Honorable Lizia speaks about um, uh, underspending, um, considering, I think for me, a secondary thought that comes or 
an, an ongoing thought then comes, or a secondary thought then becomes that when we then speak about wanting additional funding, we need to perhaps have a moment where we sit down as, as the department's entities and the committee to say, what exactly do we want the funding for? And really being able to narrow, narrow each cent down to each particular uh, you know, target that we have. Um, and also being able to clearly indicate what then would be the outcomes or the impact of this particular additional funding. Where exactly um, do we want it to go? Um, because we don't want to find ourselves with, you know, now we have the funding because, you know, and now we're not really sure um, but we're using it on and then, then there's increased underspending. And so in terms of just better planning, I think it would be essential for us to maybe have that conversation amongst ourselves um, as the department entities and of course the community as we continue to, 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 to strive to support the department, uh, its entities and the sector at large. So those are just the few remarks from members, um, comments and questions and recommendations, I think by and large came out from the deliberation. So we'll hand over to yourself, DG, and your team to respond, and then um, hopefully members would have been adequately responded to. Thanks, DG. Thanks very much, uh, Chair, and, and thanks uh, uh, to the members on the question. I want to apologize, Honorable Mkacha. I missed the 129 uh, number that um, was asked by Honorable Spear. I, I, I know uh, she was referring to something in the provinces, and I'm not sure which slide she was uh, talking to. Maybe my connection was just bad. If she could repeat the question, I'd really appreciate that. All right. Um, Honorable Sibia, do you mind just uh, repeating that question um, for the DG? Okay, DG, um, we will work towards uh, finding, uh, getting clarity on that particular question. Then we'll send it to your team either on the chat or on, on, on WhatsApp. So, but, so in the meantime, maybe you can just go ahead with the other questions and we'll come back to that one at a later stage. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, but also if uh, any one of the DSI team had the question better, they can either send me a WhatsApp or they can respond uh, at the end. And then I'll ask uh, uh, Robert perhaps to pick up a couple of questions on finance. The first one is uh, um, companies' uh, disabilities breakdown. I think there was a second question from Honorable Spear. And maybe Yona wants to quickly respond to the question about uh, the description of uh, black in the student uh, category of uh, reporting. Um, and then um, I don't know if uh, DDG Zwane wants to comment on the first set of uh, questions <clears throat> from Honorable Matlazi on the um, challenges that we have referred to uh, in terms of the impact thereof and training uh, as a result that's not happening as a result of the um, of the pandemic. Uh, I'll respond on the uh, decadal plan consultations. Uh, if Fiona could also talk about um, the comment from Honorable Mkatra on the delays on the on the regulations. Um, if Dr. Mope briefly wants to talk about the supporting documents for the emerging farmers, um, and then I'll respond on the postgraduate student demand and the A-rated researchers. Maybe Yona can give a start on that. And then Mr. Patel on the pre-approval for tax incentives and how we intend to eradicate this perennial uh, challenge. Uh, and then we take the advice on the uh, consideration for the uh, presentation format, um, uh, as well as the, um, I'll respond to the issue uh, on Ramukhatra around what do we want the money for and how we can address that process. So maybe let's start with um, Yona, the CFO, uh, DDG Zwane, um, HR, uh, and then Mr. Patel, uh, 
Dr. Morpe. Good morning, the esteemed members of the portfolio committee. Uh, on the question that Honorable Boshoff asked around the category of blacks, I think it's quite uh, clear in terms of uh, the two policy documents that we have that guide us. The formerly ministerial guidelines on postgraduate and now the postgraduate funding policy. In the category that is black, this is South African. In the this year, the regulations have already been approved by the minister for public consultations. So we're just waiting on the supply chain to get an agency to uh, conduct the uh, public consultation on the regulations. So we think that we'll be on track uh, in terms of uh, the time of uh, um, implementing the regulations. I must say, while we're talking about the implementation of the regulations, is that the work that is going on in the bio-innovation on which the DG reported, uh, with including uh, the center with, Masavisa, with Professor Masavisa at the Free State, these are currently observing the provision of the IK Act on benefit sharing and IP management. So we're not waiting for the office to be established in order to implement this. We are already working on the implementation so that the beneficiaries from the communities have already entered into contractual obligations with the entities that are engaged in the exploitation of these indigenous products. So, the value chain uh, has definitely uh, been picked up and it's continuing. The third element that the DJ has asked me to comment on, it is just fortuitous for us that uh, probably this is actually on the A-rated researchers. We had a meeting on Monday with the NRF. In part of that meeting, focused a lot more on the issues of transformation and seeking probably novel ways of uh, uh, making sure that we have a transformed uh, knowledge producers cohort. So amongst things that were raised was how do we uh, look at the aerated researchers and how do we increase the pool? How do we also enhance the numbers of emerging researchers and all that. And I'm pretty sure that the actual details of the programs are detailed in the NRF presentation that is coming through. But there was an agreement between the DSI and the NRF on the focus on this and the exploring 